Welcome to the second curator pop-up lecture, or not curator, science division pop-up lecture series. Uh, we started this series as a way to give staff and volunteers insight into some of the cool things that are going on behind the scenes in the science division, the research that's going on, the collections work that's going on. And just so you know, um, the, we're going to try to record these lectures from this, this point forward so that those who can't attend in person uh, will be able to see it probably via the hub. Uh, so you can pass that, that word on. Uh, my name is Paula Cushing. I'm curator of invertebrate zoology here, and I'm the MC for the for the evening for the evening for the morning. <laughs> so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Coons, who's the curator of archaeology at the at the museum. Michelle started here in 2012 as a postdoc, and then was hired as our curator of archaeology uh, in 2013. She studies ancient societies and is especially interested in how people of the past interacted with their environment. In her research, Michelle uses different, different methods as well as traditional archaeological techniques to uncover details about these ancient civilizations. Uh, she's conducted research throughout the United States, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, France, and China. And today, Michelle will be telling us about recent and pretty exciting research she's been conducting in Peru in her presentation, Paint, Painted Worlds, the Discovery of New Moche Murals at Panamarca, Peru. So please welcome Michelle. All right, let's do this. Let's see if my, is my mic, my mic hot? All right. <laughs> thank you, Paula, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, to this pop-up lecture. I don't know if we can dim this a little bit so you can see the imagery a little better on, on the, it seems a little bright. I don't know if you guys all agree. So that we can actually see the cool pictures. Less of me, more of the pictures. Um, so yes, thank you everyone for coming. I'm really excited to share this. I'm going to be talking about the mural discoveries that we made this past summer, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of my other research in Peru, some of my other new research, all just from this past year, and kind of contextualize it in some of my larger research questions that have to do with ancient politics and people and interacting and all kinds of social networks, that fun, all that fun stuff that is still quite relevant to people today. So some of you may have seen me talk about some of this before, but I'm gonna do a little bit of an overview. I'm focused on a culture called the Moche, and they lived on the north coast of Peru in this gray area right here. It's a very dry desert environment between the years about 300 and 900 of the common era. And this, the, this particular culture, it spans about 10 valleys. There's these fertile valleys that cross cut the desert. And we recognize it as moche. We recognize what we call the moche phenomenon by these large pyramid centers or temple centers that are locally known as wakas. Um, and they're made out of adobe brick. Most of these, there's thousands of these in this region. A lot of them have these really incredible murals, which I'll be talking more about some of these mural programs, polychrome, all kinds of mythical and real figures. They're also known for their metallurgy. Uh, copper, gold, and, um, gold, copper, gold, and silver are sort of the main metals that the moche were, were using. And then probably most famously, because so many museums throughout the world have these, they're known for their pottery, both this figural pottery where these mold maids of um, animals and plants and portrait heads of, of different individuals, and then these what are called fine line pottery vessels, where we have a cream background and then a very intricate design painted on that background in a red, in a red slip. And these are really, quite famous and there are there are thousands of them we even have some in our collections here because they have these scenes so this is one particular vessel and i'm sorry if it's a little bit blurry but i'm going to show it to you better in a second one vessel we're just looking at it in two two angles of the vessel they're called stirrup spouts and this is what we call this is a rollout drawing so it's basically we took that picture and laid it out flat um, there are all kinds of different narrative scenes on these vessels, and there's no writing in this part of the world. So for years, 
Um, art historians, uh, everybody, is ar archaeologists, have really tried to understand the culture based off of this art and try and read into the art. And what I'm going to be talking about a lot is how the archaeology helps us to inform what these, what these vessels, what these paintings are actually telling us about Moche culture. Now, this is a very famous scene from, one, from these vessels. There's about at least 100 that have this particular scene on it, but little parts and pieces of it are, show up all over in, the, in, in different, different forms. But it's not the only one, but I'm going to use this as an example here. So we know this as the sacrifice ceremony, or sometimes also called the presentation theme. And what we see on the bottom register let me get this going here, are these warriors, and they are slitting the throats of prisoners, and they're filling up these little cups here with the blood of the prisoners. And this is going on all along here, and on this upper register, we see these, um, these goblets that we do believe contain blood. These goblets have been found, and have, they've done some testing They've, that they did contain blood, being presented and processed to this sort of elite individual. And since there is no writing, we didn't really know if this, these are mythical scenes or if these are um, actually things that happened in Moche society until really about the year 1987, when, when there all kinds of gold and incredible ceramics started to flood the black market. And uh, authorities realized that a huge tomb was, was actively being looted in the town of Sipan, which is right around here on the, north, on the north coast. And so they called in authorities and said, something's going on. They called in the, or they called in the archaeologists. Archaeologists had uh, Walter Alva mounted a rescue mission to try and figure out what was going on. Unfortunately, all those materials from that one tomb, they, they're in museums, black markets, um, private collections still to this day. But what Walter Alva did discover was what today, to date, is still the richest burial that's ever been found in the New World, tons of gold. And this is the Lord of Sipan. But what was really interesting from the perspective of what we knew about archaeology, what we knew from the, the, these um, vessels, is that this individual was buried with all the accoutrements and regalia from figure A from this sacrifice ceremony. So it was this real like, oh, wow, this might be, these might be people. And there was another tomb that was found right next to the Lord of Sipan, the old lord, who was buried with all the stuff from figure B. So it was kind of like, what's going on here? But this is actually the watershed moment for Moche studies, because prior to 1987, we knew all about, about all these vessels, but there had been no excavations at these large waka centers, or really many Moche sites at all, because there was this idea that everything was looted, everything was already gone, and that more study and excavation would promote more looting. And so it just was not allowed. But then there became this realization, it's like, wow, if we don't have people go in there and study this in like the public, in, for the public and uh, produce publications, you know, really try and understand this, everything will be gone. And I should just say, this area of Peru, it looks like the surface of the moon. It's just so looted and it's been looted so much since colonial times because of just the riches that are found in this region. So 1987, after this, a whole bunch of new projects begin on Moche studies. So really, we're, it's still, the, the study of Moche is in some ways still quite young. It's much different than when we think of the Egyptian studies, which has 100 years on this, and Maya studies. And so we're still kind of figuring out a lot of things, and that's what makes it really exciting. But in 1991, a project began at this cemetery site called San Jose de Moro. And since 91, they've found eight of these priestesses that are, this person is buried with all of these, in the, the, the regalia of this person, more or less from, fake, from the sacrifice ceremony that you see here. And so this led archaeologists to realize, you know, maybe these aren't just individuals, that, but these are roles that people take on in their lifetime, much like the bishops and cardinals in a Catholic church. And so really starting to understand how this art may have related to, to um, the, what was happening in the world. After this time, all these projects began at the largest Waka Center. So in 1991, same year, projects began at the site of El Brujo, um, and then the site of Huacas de Moche. Huacas de Moche is the largest site. It's considered to be the heartland. It's kind of the middle of that gray blob I showed you. And this is just one valley to the north, also the heartland. 
In 91, they discovered some murals in um, these, these murals here that you can see here at El Brujo. Pretty exciting. These are prisoners. They're being led by a rope by these warriors around the plaza. It's pretty dramatic. And then they discovered the exact same program, more or less, there are variations, in 2004. So really quite recently at the site of Huacas de Moche. And my first time at Huacas de Moche, at the Huaca de la Luna, was in 2006. And the, the colors of these murals were just brilliant. And then I had went again in 20, 2013, but I hadn't been again to the site until this past year. And it was really pretty shocking to see how much the murals have faded um, since their discovery, not even 20 years ago. And this, um, they have one of the best conservation efforts at this site. They've developed a lot of, of um, just how to preserve this and conserve this earth and architecture, but really kind of there, there, there needs to be like even more that goes into this because this dry, desert, harsh environment with the sea air is just not very good for this. And I'm, I bring this up because this kind of falls, in, plays into the murals that we discovered and what we're doing and what we're trying to do moving forward with conservation of these incredible, incredible works. So. We're now at the end of the 1990s, and there has been this realization that this idea of moche, which we thought was this monolithic state, some people would have called it, that spanned these 10 valleys up the coast, actually had two regions of development, the northern moche and the southern moche. And this was distinguished off of these ceramics that we find in the different valleys that had been put into a, a phases of sequence, so like earliest to latest. Um, and there's also differences in architecture. So this is kind of where things were when I um, started my dissertation work uh, back a long time ago now. But in 2010, I, I decided to do a project in this Heartland Valleys, right near where the, this right here is where the Huacas de Moche is. This is El Brujo, right here. So in the northern part of the southern Moche Heartland. Um, at this site called Licapados, because I was really interested in the ceramics that were on the surface, not full ceramics like this, but this type of style. These northern, um, f uh, sorry, ceramics from the northern region as well as from the southern region, but from what's considered these like later, you know, what, are, what would have been like in the later time periods. Since then, we've been doing a ton of radiocarbon work, ton of trying to understand politics, um, exploding this out, really realizing that this does not track time uh, at all, and this, these are probably more styles, and this is where we are right now trying to understand the, the local politics in, in, in the valleys and how different places are interacting and using these different types of ceramics. So that brings us to 2022, um, and my, my research moving forward is I'm really interested in looking at the fringes of what we see as the moche world. And so in April and May this past year, I went to the far, far northern part of the moche sphere of influence. And we started a project here, I started a project with my co-director, Alicia Boswell, who's at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where um, we were just trying to first understand the landscape. No work has been done here since 1989. And we have so many tools now, like nobody's done anything since then. And we have so many tools we can use. So we did this massive drone survey to understand the architecture, um, and as well as a lot of geophysics surveys. So we did ground penetrating radar, um, magnetometry, to try and understand this landscape. It is really exciting, Not huge wakas in this particular region as well. But what's fascinating about this region, we know a lot, we know some stuff about it, is it was like an epicenter of looting in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so many materials from this region, the Vicus um, ceramics, as well as this Moche style, are in museums. And we have a really quite large collection here from this particular area, from this episode, these episodes that were happening at that time. Um, but what's really interesting is that we're just starting to kind of get into the radiocarbon dates and get some more radiocarbon dates from old collections. And what is this Moche 1, which has always been thought really early? It's matching up with all the later time periods. And this is just stuff that we've been figuring out this year. Um, and then it's found in relationship with this Vicus materials, which is really an interesting different style that has... Um, kind of looks like stuff you see in Ecuador and Colombia. So thinking about these relationships and what's happening here, what's happening with people using moche and people using this. 
And this particular region is really well known for its metallurgy, some of the most complicated um, and advanced metallurgy that's ever been um, discovered, all looted from these crazy tombs in, the, in, that, in that time period. So much of it's in the Met and throughout the world, but really innovative metal work that's happening here in a very moche style with moche iconography. So I'm really excited to continue this project and try and understand from the north. But this kind of falls in, plays into, so that's my project up in Vicus. I already did this work in the heartland. And now we're going to Panyamarca. This is where, um, where the murals are. And um, this is the, what we consider the southernmost, or the southern monumental frontier of the moche. There's, a, there's dribs and drabs of moche material a little bit further to the south, but this is where we have like this massive, impressive waka. And this project I'm doing uh, with Lisa Trevor from Columbia University. So just had to, had to put her in there. <laughs> so Panyamarca, I mean, it's a quite an impressive place. Uh, huge wakas, other temples. This building, no one's even touched. We don't have no idea what was going on there. Um, you can see it's all built into this rocky outcrop, which is very typical in, in this region. Um, here's another Rick pick. So <laughs> thanks, Rick. <laughs> we'll be uh, looking forward to getting some more Rick picks in the future. But Panyamark is quite famous because in the 1930s, this mural, was, murals were discovered there. They were not published until 1958. And the, but very, very famously, it became known as this mural of this priestess, called the priestess, but an elite female figure. And this, the drawing of this wasn't even done until the 70s. There's other murals that were, were discovered there, very poorly published. And so Lisa Trevor went back in 2010 for her dissertation work to document what was left of some of these murals and to try and understand what, might, what else might be there, what if, if anything is left. And she, what she ended up discovering was that there, every surface behind the, the adobe that you see is basically painted. The entire place would have just been dazzling with paintings everywhere. It's kind of hard to even fathom. So I have a video here. Let me see if I can get this to work. A drone video. Um, so I'm going to be talking mostly about this particular building here. It looks kind of small and unassuming, but this is the Hall of the Painted Pillars and where many of these murals we are, have been discovered where we focused our excavations on. That um, priestess was right here, and some of those other murals that Lisa had found were in here as well. I excavated right here. I'll be talking about this on the main platform one. And this is a huge plaza area, which was also lined with murals as well. We, have, we can see some of the remnants of it. So I'll, I'll be talking about the corner of this plaza as well. And you can see this landscape. It's just crazy. They like, built this on top of this just rocky outcrop. It's really, it's really stunning. It really is. Um, let's see here. OK. So these are some of the murals that Lisa found in 2010 in that hall of painted pillars. And you can see these are actually pillars. This is just pictures of the pillars. And so we went back to this in 2022. and. Um, and revealed even more of the murals in this space. And so I should note, when we do these excavations, the archaeologists and um, Lisa's actually an art historian with a very deep background in archaeology, but we plan where to put the excavations and we'll do all the heavy lifting or the directing of where we need to go. But as soon as we get up to a mural, we bring our conservators in. We work really closely with our team of conservators and they're the ones who reveal it. They're the ones who bring it to life um, and and expose it, consolidate, kind of do what needs to be done so that nothing you know, falls off uh, and we can make sure it's, it's as good as possible. You really probably don't want me doing that, honestly. Um, I could do it, but <laughs> you know, it, it, it's better to have these folks who are insanely patient and um, really good at, at making sure that we just preserve them as well as possible. Our goals are to just document these as much as possible. And so we work, we work with artists. Our, um, this is Pedro. He's an amazing, talented artist who matches all of his colors with the, with the colors on the murals. Um, we do photogrammetry, different kinds of scanning to, preserve, to 
to document these as well as possible. And what's so incredible, this particular image, this two-faced person has never been seen before, ever. And it's almost as though we're seeing some kind of movement here. You know, maybe there's dancing that's being represented. You can see he's got this feather type, um, feather thing potentially in, in his hand, moving, whatnot. So really, really cool. So this is what that building looks like so far that we understand it. There are these pillars. This is a plan view looking down on it. And you can see we've, these are 2010 excavations. This is our, pat, the purple ones are this past year. And we've really only scratched the surface. And this is like that tiny building. Um, what we're seeing are just these crazy epic battle scenes. You see these mythical strombus shell monsters fighting moche warriors and people carrying stirrup spouts. So really cool stuff. So this, this is the corridor right here. This is the corridor. I'm going to be kind of paying, playing, paying attention to this wall along the corridor. And when we started excavating, we realized that there were some structural issues here. And it had some like kind of really critical conservation concerns. So we were only able to go so far. Next year, we we're going to go back to, and do the conservation work to make, ensure that this area is is safe so that we can go down further. Um, and so here's some of Pedro's, Pedro's drawings of so far of that particular area. And just again, here's our, one of our other conservators, Blanca, um, revealing and, and revealing these, these painted surfaces. There's another guy holding a stirrup spout bottle with like an animal shape. So right here where Pedro is drawing, is where we're seeing this particular scene. So you can see we only got the top of it, and there's another register down here. This was exposed in 2010. But what we're seeing is, OK, and then the next slide, we're going to see what's on this wall, so this corridor that you can see here. We had to leave a bulk for safety purposes. So on that wall, we have this other mural. We were not able to draw it in the field. We ran out of time, so we took really really detailed notes and we're working now with an illustrator who will turn this into a watercolor um, watercolor based off of some of the work she's been doing she has this really an intricate process of trying to understand what you can see and what you can't see and how to actually make that come to life without making without basically inventing what's there and so um but you can see this is some of the notes on how to how to make that come to life so what, what what we're starting to see on this on this corridor is this massive procession that's happening so there's all these people and they all have something in their hand um we're not sure exactly this guy's got like some kind of snake thing he's got the stirrup spout we don't know yet this is behind the wall tbd um this guy's got some stuff and then there is a meeting happening between two people. And what's fascinating is that this person is wearing um, Highland clothing. So stuff that we see up there, high up in the mountains. Again, this is the coast. Very atypical for moche because we usually see only foreigners represented in moche art in battle scenes, and this is not a battle scene. This is these two individuals coming together, and this is another one of these elite females. So really cool. She um, has some of the same clothing as this original priestess who has this goblet here. We don't know what's in her hand. Super excited for 2023 to find out what's in her hand. Um, we're not really sure what else she's wearing. We can see the snake head that's on her belt. You can see the snake head on the belt. This is another representation of less ornate from 2010 that was um, discovered. But this meeting that is obviously happening between these two um, people really is highlighting and putting a big like, capital T on just the power that females had at the site and the power of the women in, in this particular, not in Moche society, which we already knew that females had a lot of power, but this is really, really cool to see. This is happening right in the middle of that wall. So just to highlight, you know, we've already talked about the priestesses at San Jose de Moro, that cemetery site where there's found eight priestesses. There's been no elite males really found there. 
Um, and then in 20, 2005, the Senora de Cowell was found at the site of El Brujo, and she was buried with all these like warrior like influence. She had atlatls, but they were gold, and these are war clubs called puras. Um, and I mean, they they take such pride in these discoveries. Now they have like Senora de Cal Day at the site, and they have people dress up, and they dress up like the murals, and they do dances, and they parade her around town. The center of the town has like a statue of her in it. So pretty people are pretty into when these discoveries are made, and they get they take a lot a lot of pride in their ancient past through these discoveries. So really strong female presence there. On this bottom register too, these are all actually women as well. So this one hasn't been quite drawn yet, but this person is holding some kind of weaving into implement. And in the Andes, actually textiles, not we're not 100% sure for this region, but for most other regions, textiles are more um, worth more than gold and worth more than precious metals. And so w this person is doing something with the textiles here. But again, we don't really know what else is happening. So exciting to find this all out, hopefully next year and in the future. And so that being said, we, um, through the Avenir Conservation Center, have dedicated seven years of funding to continue the work here, to try and better understand not only this particular monument, but other parts of the site where we know we're gonna find these painted surfaces. And so this is the end of the season, and that's the monument. So what we have to do is cover it all back up. It's the only way these will stay preserved, because there's just, if what was what we what we've witnessed at the Walk Day Walk de la Luna? What we watched these really incredibly talented um, con conservators fight is the elements, and so this is really the only way. But being at an institution like this, we have these really awesome opportunities to envision how we can bring these spaces to life even if we can't physically go in them. And so, you know, thinking through, can we do kinds of, you know, life-size re reenactments using all kinds, you know, actually physically building them or using AR, VR, different types of things. So really exciting to have that opportunity to think through this and to continue this conservation work with our, our conservators here, um, trying to understand not only the paintings, but also the architecture and the adobes and how we work with all of that together. So just I wanted to quickly talk about, so that was all happening in this hall, the Painted Pillars Hall, but I was excavating on this corner of this main waka, this, um, this platform one, because I was curious, you know, this is like the largest waka in this part of, of Peru, and so what was happening here? Um, what I found was actually really interesting, and so I found that there were four layers of these Cosma floors. The Cosma culture is a local culture that is post moche, so probably from around the year 900 to 1200 or so. And there's four levels of these floors, and this corridor wall is Cosma, and this final facade of the waka is actually Cosma. It's not moche. No one had ever known this. And, but we did find the moche underneath. And we also found a, um, in the corridor, we found a, a mummy, which is incredibly well-preserved, female holding spondylus shells in her hand, really um, beautiful textile, woven textile, as some kind of dedica dedicatory offering on this corner right here. Um, and, but we did find a part of a moche mural. You can just see the feet. These are probably two people fighting. Um, a little one, but this was all destroyed. And so what the Cosma came in and like destroyed things in this area, whereas in the hall of the painted pillars, they didn't destroy anything. We actually had evidence of the evidence of the Cosma people going in, reopening things, doing some offerings, like splattering some stuff on the walls, covering it back up, leaving some food stuff. So something different, interesting relationships of ancestor worship and how you kind of um, you know, relive and reoccupy spaces going on here that we're just starting to understand. So we do have the moche underneath, so that means the moche walk is inside. Um, and we don't, we're probably not gonna get there. But it, what really ended up happening, what this all means is that, okay, this is not moche, which big, big news. We also thought this was the front. There's a zigzag ramp that goes up here. It's been very destroyed. There was a big earthquake here in 1971 and a lot of architecture fell. But that's not moche. And so always thought this was the front. I thought I was digging on the front side of the waka right here. But we actually, which makes a lot more sense, 
duh, need to reorient, and this is probably the front of the waka because this is where the plaza is, and if it has any, if it's analogous at all with our other wakas and Waka de la Luna, the plaza comes off the front of the wakas. And so now for 2023, we're gonna uh, refocus to this structure that's in the corner of the plaza. And if it has any kind of thing to do with any of the other walkas, this is where some really interesting architecture is going on. This particular room at the Waka de Moche, Waka de la Luna, is they call it the complex theme because no one knows what it is. It's complex. <laughs> so, but that's it, that's analogous to to the place where we're going to be digging. And I just found out that. Um, a Peruvian archaeologist was poking around there in the 70s, didn't publish anything, and was like, just was like talking with my co-director, and she was like, yeah, he's like, oh yeah, there's all kinds of interesting things in there. There's burnt roofing on the surface, so 2023, that's where we're going to go, and we're going to see, that's where I'm going to be excavating most of my time. We're going to see what's going on in, the, in this corner of this, pl of this plaza. So... All right, some final thoughts for now. Obviously, this is just the beginning of so much of this, and I'm, I'm just so excited to be exploring this civilization culture that I've worked with from so, for so long from these two extremes and finding really radically different things. But at the same time, there we see that people are doing things differently, and they have a lot more creative um, ability, creative freedom. So the the Highlander, it's not seen as so rigid, and we're just going to fight them. They're inviting them in. It's in the case of like Ecuadorian materials, and then here the in the in the south, these um, Highland materials. And so just it's really exploding our understanding of what what is moche? What is it? Is it a, what? How do we even define this as this suite of materials that we see? And so I always, I it always just makes me go back to this Tip O'Neill quote, you know, of all politics is local, and that's today as well as in the past. And I think this is where things are. Just yeah, I'm really excited to see how we can move forward with this because we're really, really, you know, it, it's 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 a cool place to be, so to speak. So tons of people to thank for these both both of these projects. We just work with these incredible communities. We have just incredible support systems there. I gotta give a shout out to Jessica. She's our um, Peruvian co-director and director of the, of the project in, at Panamarca. Uh, did the whole thing with her two-year-old on her hip. Um, so we just, uh, uh, and we're all female-led. Both projects are all run by, by women, by female archeologists. We all have kids. We all try to bring our kids to the field, and we're finding all this really cool girl power stuff at these sites. So it's just really inspiring um, after, I would say, I don't know, so many years of that not being the case in understanding Moche, um, Moche society, so pretty cool stuff. So thank you. I'll leave our kids up here. <laughs> I know I, I kind of took a little bit extra time here, but if there's any questions, if people can stay, I'm happy to answer a couple. We, and we have, we'll, we'll, we'll leave like five, 10 minutes for questions. So I have questions if nobody else does. <laughs> Hold on, let me come back. I don't want to stand up. Um, so you said on the mural that you saw this person meeting the Highlander. Is there any like more archaeological evidence that you found of stuff that's not from like this Moche or Cosma area that's like maybe from up in the in the Highlands? Yeah, that's a really good question. We do see what the the Highland culture that's contemporary with the Moche in this particular region is called the Requai. And we do see required materials in this region. Um, and so, but I don't think we fully have appreciated that just like depth of interaction in this particular region. So yeah, we do, we do see them. Hi. Um, do the people in modern Peru um, have, do you know if they have a sense of ancestry? Uh, I know Inca, but some of these previous civilizations, do they embrace all of these civilizations as their ancestors? It's a really complicated, complicated scene in Peru. So 
this is, I could talk about this for like four hours, but I'll give you a short version of the answer. Um, so the Spanish, when the Spanish came to Peru, decimated the coastal regions. The coastal regions are very different than the highland regions, which still have strong Quechua, Amara, you know, roots. Coastal regions decimated, and those who were left were forcibly round up and resettled into what are called reducciones. Um, there has not been a long tradition of, of um, so the people who live today do not have that deep rooted tradition. The languages were all are all extinct. You know, we have little pieces like, and little like toponyms and stuff. And it, for example, even Pedro's last name is it, it's a indigenous last name in the now extinct Kingdom language. So, um, but it's very fascinating because the the through the last since eighty seven or so there's been a rediscovery of those ancient cultures and a, a new embrace, embracing of those cultures and celebration. And so now you go into any town and people are using moche symbols on their political ads. You know, they'll be like, I'm the warrior. And, and just, so really, and the town centers are have um, like the little um, roundabouts, there'll be like a moche waka as, the, as you enter, or uh, waka, sorry, that's the, the waka is the name for like the ceramic vessel. And so, and like I said, these, these parades and ceremonies and like holidays that have popped up all around the archeology. span And so when big burials are discovered, it's become this huge, uh, for a lot of people, it's a huge sense of pride and museums are built around them and it brings economic well-being into the area. And so the people in the town that's right next to the site of Panyamarca are super interested in the potential for touristic development and really excited about learning about the people, like having that sort of like, wow, the, you know, that connection to the past. So it's a very complicated, very different than nor North America, but also really it's very dynamic. This is super awesome, thank you. Um, with the fact that these murals tend to fade over time with the air and everything, is there evidence that the, um, these people were repainting these murals frequently because of that, or did they have their own conservation efforts? Have you discovered anything like that? Yes, it's actually really complicated. So those ones that you're seeing right now, those are that we just exposed, there are at least in some instances eight layers of paint on them. So we don't know what was underneath, and maybe we'll never know. Maybe we can find some awesome technology that'll let us like see below. But yeah, they're constantly were being repainted, touched up. And then the way that these architectural um, wakas they were built they're like onions and so and we think there may they may have there was probably some kind of generational cycle of building another layer on the outside and there's oftentimes sacrificial um, sacrifices inside those layers of the of the waka and so as you go back in time you can see the murals from the other from the earlier wakas and so there's, there's, and that's what gets complicated too, is trying to track it all through time and how it works. But yes, that's, that's why we are able to find some today. And then there's so many that have been, we just will never know what was there. Hey, Michelle. Um, when these were painted, was there sunlight coming on them? Or was this a place where it was revealed through torches? I'm thinking of like, on impact, where they where they had to go in and didn't have light sources. Could you speak to that? And could you paint a picture of what it would have been like to stand there at the time when they were built? Like, sure. what did these structures feel like? What I see is filled in and having to pull rubble away. So, what did yeah. that look like originally? It's a good question. Now, I think we're gonna what we're we're talking about are multiple different things, right? In term, multiple different ways of seeing these murals. So maybe in the hall of the painted pillars, that would have been very intimate. You know, who knows if that would probably have been some kind of restricted space, certain activities performed in there, certain individuals that were invited into those activities, probably roofed, probably not really easy to see as you were navigating through those small spaces. But when you're in the plaza, those murals would have been completely visible. The murals on, on the facades of the buildings, completely visible. So I think there, there were different levels of visibility depending on who was allowed to be invited into that conversation with it. But when you would have walked up to that site that you, know, you can see it here, it just would have been dazzling. Probably a white backdrop, ba backdrop with then just all of these brilliant colors of murals everywhere. And so, um, it's a great question, but it's not that intimate 
sort of just that not in general this just what used for only intimate purposes there's a much wider use of them okay. yeah other questions <laughs> thank you thank you this is so fascinating it's just inspiring um i do this is just a non-archaeology question really how what Clearly, there are the different cultures that have built these walls over the walls, but is that how this became so filled in? What, at what point was it abandoned? Yeah. And then a side question is, what do you do about current looting problems? Yeah, these are good, really good questions. Um, so the final, the yes, all of these sites are much are definitely reoccupation, occupation again. And so um, we have evidence at this particular at Panya Market going back to. Um, 2000 BCE, so before, like going back almost like um, 4,000 years of people using this. There's stone temples from that particular time period. Um, and so, yes, some of it is the filling in by later cultures, the capping, but then a lot of it has just been lost to time. Um, and because the, so the Cosmo were there, the Cosmo were basically kind of overtaken by the Inca. In Inca came to the North Coast in the 1470s. They, you know, things were still, we, this particular site, we don't have an abandonment date on. Some of our latest, we have dates going into the late 1400s though. So people were there, but I, I mean, it's just from like, maybe they were reusing it as a corral. We have that evidence too. But you know, years and years of kind of falling and it, so it's very complicated what we call like taphonomic process of how these things end up in the state that they are today. Again, very seismically active area. And so the, the, some of these surfaces that you can see today would have been painted, but those paintings are gone from the elements. And so there's a mixture of rubble and elemental things that are happening. Looting today is challenging. And I think um, you, if you talk to most people in the, minis um, the Ministry of Culture, Looting is not the biggest concern today. The biggest concern is um, growth of cities and agriculture. And these are what are infringing onto many of these archaeological landscapes. Ugh, chicken farmers, my god, they'll just go anywhere and put their chicken farms. Um, I, I have, a, I don't know, they like came in and like built on top of Lycopodos. I'm still very sad about this. So um, it's really this industry and this growth that's affecting more so than the looting. Looting still is a problem. It's going to always be a problem. There are really strict laws in Peru for import, export, for trying to mitigate that. And um, there are these sites, a lot of these bigger sites are protected. And this site, for example, has a guard. Um, He's 75 and really tiny, but he's amazing. And unfortunately, they now mandate everyone who's 75 to retire in Peru. So we're not really sure what's going to happen moving forward. We can take a couple more questions. Let me go back, and then I'll get Chris. Um, Michelle, can we go back to the... the um, paintings, the wall paintings, are they frescoes? Are they painted on plaster or? They're painted plaster. So it's like a whitewash kind of slip that they then put on the wall. And they're, so it's interesting, the paintings are done differently in different region, in the different regions. And so um, the ones in the heartland, some of the, ear, the earlier ones are these bas relief ones. And they're almost like jumping out at you. Um, but then when you get to Panya Marker, we haven't found any bas relief, but they're, do, they're incising, they're like sketching what they're gonna draw first, and then, they, then they're doing the paintings. But it is, it's not, it is like a, paint, a plaster incision, and then the, paint, the, the paints go over top of that. And we're doing some pigment analysis to understand better what, what are these paints. I mean, there's lots of hematites and um, iron oxides and stuff like that, but trying to, trying to really work this out is something that hasn't been done yet. Hello. Okay. Um, so I may be misremembering, but when you were talking about the ceramics that you know were found, and you thought that it at once kind of laid out a timeline. Yeah. So how, with knowing that those ceramic vessels are kind of all from the similar time frame, how has that like shifted the story that those ceramics tell, or 
like how does it tell a new story if those are from the same time period? I love this question because this is like, I've, I've just got really hung up on that exact question and I've been writing lots of papers about it. Um, it's, it really is shifting our landscape. And so there was always this idea that Moche started around the year zero and ended in the year 800. And now we understand that Moche is actually much later. And what we're seeing is what, what I'm seeing in as we get more and more radiocarbon dates. And those radiocarbon dates are obviously from materials that are um, short, well, not obviously, they need to be from like short lived samples. But if they're in association with a ceramic style that we can say this is the style, then we can get kind of an idea of maybe when these were used at different sites. And so really trying to get lots of dates in association with these styles and trying to understand how these styles were used at what time periods in these different valleys. And what we're seeing is that I think most of what we understand of, as moche is really going to be only from 600 to 900, because most of these dates are late, that these earlier, what we thought were earlier, are not, they're all being used in the same time frame, but we, we're gonna be able to get hopefully some more granularity within that time frame. But we're really trying to now understand those as styles, and what are those styles telling us about politics? and people, and because pots are not people, that's the, you know, the first thing that we learn and are, as archeologists, archeology span 101, you can't say that, but how are these being used? And so it's just, it, the, the, the fact that we've exploded the idea that those are just phases, this is just chronology that it's tracking, has just created a much more complicated um, network of trying to understand who was trading with who, who was emulating who, who was you know, using that style but making it in their own clay. And so we're just, just starting to understand this. So I don't think I can give you a full answer. <laughs> Any other questions? So I think this is a good time to thank Michelle for an excellent thank you, talk. Thank you. And she lives here, so if you do have other questions, just come on up. <laughs> just come and ask me. All right, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it.